on World News Tonight. Davos 2022, the economic forum kicks off as leaders warn against a looming economic storm. Monkeypox warning, investigations underway as to how the virus spread and now reaching Europe. Surprise warning, US President in Asia vows to defend Taiwan if China invades. Tonight, find out the heated response from China. And it's the May snow. Fields of narcissists cover the Swiss meadows as they reach full bloom. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News tonight. The 2022 edition of the World Economic Forum is largely focused on Russia's war in Ukraine and its implications for the global economy. As food and fuel prices soar and shortages loom, the head of the UN Development Programme said that the international community must do more to protect the most vulnerable. It's a very different kind of Davos. The World Economic Forum's annual meeting of business and world leaders is back after a hiatus due to the global health crisis. And a move from January to May means the elites gather amid spring sunshine, not deep snow. But the conflict in Ukraine casts a long shadow. Monday saw the event begin in earnest with an address by Ukrainian leader Volodymyr Zelensky. Do not wait for more fatal attacks. Do not wait for Russia to use special weaponry, chemical, biological, God forbid, nuclear. Do not allow for the aggressor to feel that the world's opposition is not decisive enough. Act straight away and in the strongest fashion to defend freedom and the normal order. Order that is beneficial for everyone in the world. Ukraine clearly does top the agenda. What is usually the Russia House on Davos's main street has been transformed into a photo exhibition depicting the conflict. Related issues, from food supplies to the global energy crisis, feature heavily on the agenda. But familiar Davos themes haven't gone away. Opening the event, WEF Executive Chairman Klaus Schwab outlined some. The issue of climate change and all the other issues related to the preservation of nature. And finally, we look at the future of the global economy with great concerns. Too high inflation, too low growth, too many debts. Meanwhile, out on the main street, cryptocurrency firms are again out in force, despite the recent crash for Bitcoin and rivals. Besides being sunnier, though, this year's event is also smaller. Delegate numbers are down by about a fifth, with regulars like JP Morgan boss Jamie Dimon among the absentees. Some other familiar faces are notable by their absence. This year, Russia's oligarchs and business leaders didn't get an invite. A judge in a Ukrainian court in Kyiv handed down a life sentence to a 21-year-old Russian soldier accused of war crimes. Ukraine is accusing Russia of widespread uh, atrocities and brutality against civilians. A Ukraine court has sentenced a Russian soldier to life in jail for killing an unarmed civilian in the first war crimes trial arising from Moscow's invasion. 21-year-old tank commander Vadim Shishi Marin pleaded guilty to killing Alexander Shelipov in Chupahivka on February 28th, four days after the invasion began. The judge said Shishi Marin was carrying out a criminal order by a soldier of a higher rank when he fired several shots at the 62-year-old's head from an automatic weapon. When asked previously if he had been obliged to follow that order, Shishi Marin said no. Has the person found guilty understood his verdict? You have the right to appeal your sentence. Shishi Marin watched the proceedings silently from a reinforced glass box in the courtroom. He showed no emotion as the verdict was delivered and stood with his head bowed throughout the proceedings. Shishi Marin's lawyer said he would launch a legal appeal. In court last week, Shishi Marin acknowledged he was to blame and asked the victim's widow to forgive him. Ukrainian state prosecutors said Shishi Marin and four other Russian servicemen stole a car to escape after their column was targeted by Ukrainian forces. 
After driving into Chupahivka, the soldiers saw Shelipov riding a bicycle and talking on his phone. Prosecutors say Shishi Marim was ordered to kill Shelipov to prevent him reporting on their location. The trial has huge symbolic significance for Ukraine. Elsewhere during the conflict, Ukraine has consistently accused Russia of atrocities and brutality against civilians and claims to have identified over 10,000 possible war crimes. The International Criminal Court is also leading a team of prosecutors investigating such allegations in the country. Russia denies targeting civilians or any involvement in war crimes in what it calls a special military operation. The Kremlin did not immediately comment on Monday's verdict. It has previously said that it has no information about the trial and that the absence of a diplomatic mission in Ukraine limits its ability to assist. New photographs of UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson drinking at a leaving party at his Downing Street residence have been published, reigniting opposition accusations that he breached his own COVID-19 lockdown rules. He has raised his glass and is making a toast in front of a group of people with several wine bottles on a table just inches away. The photos of Boris Johnson obtained by ITV News are of a leaving party in Downing Street on the 13th of November 2020. The gathering is a clear violation of Covid lockdown rules at the time and contradict his repeated statements to Parliament that he had done nothing wrong. Sue Gray's general I'm very, very sorry for misjudgments that may be made in, uh, by me or anybody else in number 10 uh, and the Cabinet Office, and I, I can only uh, ask him respectfully, uh, Mr Speaker, to look at what Sue Gray has said, but also to, look at the, to wait for the conclusion of the inquiry. It is another field day for the opposition, with Deputy Labour leader Angela Rayner saying... Boris Johnson said repeatedly that he knew nothing about law-breaking. There's no doubt now he lied. Deputy Liberal Democrat leader Daisy Cooper said Conservative MPs must do their duty and sack him. And Tory MP Roger Gale told Times Radio that he misled us from the dispatch box and honourably there is one answer. But will he resign? Johnson has resisted pressure so far. The photos emerge, however, just ahead of the full release of Sue Gray's report on Partygate, a scandal concerning more than a dozen gatherings. I'm, with great respect, not going to uh, comment or give any running commentary on uh, her report until we get it. And I, I think that, to be frank, the moment is not very far off. He has clung on to power, but his supporters will now fear that these latest photographs and Sue Gray's report could be the final nail in his coffin as Prime Minister. Now in the latest role between USA and China, US President Biden said the US will defend Taiwan military if Beijing invaded the self-ruled island, warning China was flirting with danger. The United States would be willing to use force to defend Taiwan, President Joe Biden said on Monday in a comment that appeared to be a departure from existing U.S. policy on the self-ruled island. When asked by a reporter if the U.S. would defend Taiwan if it were attacked, Biden's answer was straight to the point. Yes, that's a commitment we made. Biden added that it was his expectation that such an event would not happen or be attempted. The U.S. currently maintains a policy of so-called strategic ambiguity on whether it would intervene militarily to protect Taiwan in the event of a Chinese attack. China considers the Democratic Island as part of its territory under its One China policy. It says it is the most sensitive and important issue in its ties with Washington. Following Biden's comments, China's foreign ministry spokesman Wan Wenbing said China deplored and rejected the U.S. remarks and added that issues surrounding Taiwan were purely part of China's internal affairs and that they would not stand for any foreign interference. A White House official later said there was no change in policy towards Taiwan. Biden made a similar comment about defending Taiwan in October, which White House officials also dismissed saying the president was not announcing any changes in U.S. policy. Biden's comments come during a visit to Japan, his first since taking office. 
Speaking in a news conference alongside Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, the U.S. president made other tough comments about China's increasingly assertive posture in the region. Biden's remarks are likely to overshadow the centerpiece of his Japan visit, the launch of an Indo-Pacific economic framework, a broad plan providing an economic pillar for U.S. engagement with Asia. Kishida said he had told Biden Japan would consider various options to boost their defense capabilities, including the ability to retaliate and including a considerable increase in its defense budget. China has called a mission by the UN rights chief a chance to clarify misinformation ahead of a visit to Xinjiang as Uyghurs want a public relations stunt may lie in wait. Parts of the international community have long expressed skepticism over the credibility of UN Chief Michelle Bachelet's mission to China. Words from Beijing this Monday failed to reassure critics. Due to the impact of the epidemic, Bachelet's visit to China will take a closed-loop approach. The two sides agreed not to arrange follow-up visits by journalists. Pressure has been mounting on the UN to shed some light on the situation in Xinjiang, a key stop on Bachelet's visit. Chinese authorities have been accused of committing rights abuses against Muslim Uyghurs in the region, allegations Beijing denies. Now with the government watching Bachelet's trip closely, some fear the UN chief will not be able to freely assess conditions in Xinjiang. The UN claims up to one million people are being held in camps in Xinjiang because of their Muslim faith. The U.S. says Beijing is committing genocide against Uyghurs at the camps. The Chinese government rejects this, arguing the facilities are being used to counter extremism. Washington has also slammed Bashley, claiming the UN chief has failed to stand up for the Uyghur community. It's going to short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. As more monkeypox cases are reported across Europe, medical experts are trying to understand how the disease traveled far from its African origins to cause outbreaks in Europe and North America. But with no sign of mutation and with smallpox vaccines highly effective in preventing monkeypox, experts are not too concerned about the disease. Denmark and Scotland on Monday registered their first cases of monkeypox. Cases in England more than doubled on Monday to 56, prompting UK health authorities to advise close contacts to isolate for up to three weeks. The World Health Organization is tracking more than 100 confirmed or suspected cases of monkeypox in at least 12 non-African countries. Scientists try to grapple with how monkeypox outbreaks have traveled outside African borders all the way to Europe and North America. We've seen a few cases in Europe over the last five years, just in travelers, but this is the first time we're seeing cases across many countries at the same time uh, in people who have not traveled uh, to, the, to the endemic regions in Africa. The leading theory behind the transnational spread is suggested by Dr. David Heyman, advisor to the World Health Organization. He told the Associated Press that the outbreaks may have started from sexual transmissions at raves in Spain and Belgium. Many diseases can be spread through sexual contact. You can get a cough or a cold through sexual contact, but it doesn't mean that it's a sexually transmitted disease. Experts say that monkeypox is unlikely to develop into another COVID-19 scare. They also say that there is very little to suggest that monkeypox has mutated. We should say that most of the people who have been identified so far have had more mild disease or let's say not severe disease. And the thing I just want to say here is that this is a containable situation. Smallpox vaccines are 85% effective in preventing monkeypox. Several countries have started stockpiling them in preparation for new outbreaks. South Korea, as of now, has enough vaccines for more than 35 million people, almost 70% of the population. Vaxzevria, AstraZeneca's COVID vaccine, has been approved for the use as a third dose booster for adults in the European Union. AstraZeneca's COVID-19 vaccine has been approved for use as a booster in the European Union. That's according to the British drug maker Monday. It means the vaccine, called Vaxzevria, can be used as a third-dose booster in adults. 
The shot would also be suitable for those who have been inoculated by an mRNA vaccine like those developed by Pfizer and Moderna. AstraZeneca said ensuring the longer duration of immune protection was essential for the long-term management of the global health crisis. A committee of the European Medicines Agency backed its shot as a booster last Thursday. It comes just weeks after the regulator allowed the use of Pfizer-BioNTech's booster for adults who had been previously inoculated with other vaccines. Many vaccine makers have said that most shots this year will be boosters or first inoculations for children. We have some good news for you. Most anti-cancer drugs are administered in injection form. The drugs are usually given in their inactive state, though because they are not soluble in their active form, which reduces their efficacy. But a domestic bio company has developed a method for an injection solution in the active form. This is an anti-cancer drug called ironotecan that's been used to treat colon cancer. It gets injected into a patient in an inactive form before becoming active within the patient's body. This action not only makes the drug less efficient, but it also has risks of side effects. Aeronauticon is the most commonly used anti-cancer drug for metastatic colon cancer. It's inactive, so needs to be converted into an active anti-cancer substance, SN38, in the liver. The conversion rate's about 5%, so it's necessary to develop a new anti-cancer compound to increase the treatment's effect. Now, a domestic bio company has developed a method that melts the substances together in their active form, the first time that technology has made this possible. We attach a hydrophilic compound to the parts of the insoluble drug that have a similar properties. That forms a primary particle, but this primary particle also has both hydrophilic and hydrophobic parts. So we've developed a method that encloses this antipathic compound to melt the insoluble particles. Last year, this biodevelopment company presented their results from an animal testing to the American Cancer Society, during which they showed the drug's anti-cancer substance to be four times more effective in their active state. Since then, the company has conducted phase one clinical trials for colon cancer and stomach cancer and aimed to enter phase two of clinical trials by the second half of this year. When this method becomes approved for commercialization, it will allow the anti-cancer drug to be administered in its active form, which would be in smaller doses than before, with the additional advantage of reducing side effects. After nearly 15 years in Russia, Starbucks announced that it will exit the market as the coffee company joins fast food chain McDonald's and end its presence in the country. Starbucks will exit Russia after nearly 15 years, the company announced on Monday, joining a wave of American companies pulling out of that country in response to the war in Ukraine. Seattle-based Starbucks has 130 stores in Russia, with nearly 2,000 employees in the country. In March, Starbucks shuttered its stores and suspended all business activity in Russia, including the shipment of its products to the country. Monday's decision makes that suspension permanent. Christian Ledoux, the director of investment research at CapTrust in San Antonio, says with the move unlikely to significantly impact Starbucks's bottom line, the company had no choice. Starbucks's move comes a week after an even more iconic American company, McDonald's, pulled the plug on its Russian restaurants. On Monday, its trademarked Golden Arches were removed from a store near Moscow. That exit was a far more significant business decision. Starbucks did not provide details on the financial impact of the exit. McDonald's said it would take a primarily non-cash charge of up to $1.4 billion. Welcome back to World News Tonight. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A state security official in Ethiopia's northern Amhara region says that more than 4,000 people have been arrested, including over 200 for alleged killings. The leaders of the US, Australia, India and Japan have kicked off their Quad Summit in Tokyo, where a wide range of issues from economics to a free and wide open Indo-Pacific are expected to top the agenda. A 10-story building partially collapsed in Iran's southern city of Abadan, resulting in five deaths with at least 80 people still trapped underneath the rubble. 
Germany wants to intensively pursue gas and renewable energy projects with Senegal, Chancellor Olaf Scholz said during his first trip to Africa against the backdrop of the war in Ukraine and its impact on energy and food prices. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and US President Joe Biden held a bilateral meeting in Tokyo and affirmed their alliance to strengthen their trade, technology and defence ties. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with a look at fields of narcissists covering up the foothills of the Alps. Thank you for watching us again. Stay safe and have a good night.